old trails and ghost towns. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley with you. And I thought we'd pretty much gone back to the boundary country as many times as we could, but you have a story, a theory, about some potential which has your mouth watering all over again. Well, Mike, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating part of the province, first of all. For its, for its size, it was a massive producer of copper, gold, silver, you name it. And secondly, sometimes when you do more research on a story you may have done, you get a little bit of additional information. This is what happened here. Now, we'll be touching on three stories today, hopefully, if we get through them all. And we've done a little bit on each one of those, yeah. but we haven't done the full story. Okay. So we have, we've done about 100 lost mines and treasure stories on the program over the 10 years, and uh, we've chosen three at random. I think this is a good one. Now, we touched on Sam Bombini and his lost, uh, his lost pit of gold, uh, gold ore. Yeah, we I touched remember on that, that when there were yeah. pits all over the place. That's right, okay. and we touched on Jolly Jack Thornton. Mm -hmm. and Thornton's lost, lost mine. That's right, but I went back to see one of the family, Vera Cuthbert, who was Sam Bombini's daughter, and I said, Vera, did Sam tell me the whole story? And Sam told me when he was about 80 years old, and Sam was a marvelous man, but he held back just a little bit. He thought he'd go back, and he didn't want to give the exact details away. So she said, actually, he shifted slightly east of where he said he was. Interesting setup to that. We'll come back in just a minute to find out more about this interesting new potential of gold in the boundary country right after this break. Don't go away. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley, and we're talking about the country. Well, it's uh, Phoenix, Greenwood, Grand Forks, uh, even a place called Anaconda. Yeah. Multi-millions of dollars made, but also invested. This is not your easy yeah. placer ripoff. This yeah. is big money to yeah. make this thing work. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, you know, there were major camps in the area and a bunch of small towns. You mentioned Anaconda, and Anaconda was a rival of Greenwood for a very, very short time. There's the Anaconda Hotel. Main Street looked like it was going somewhere. It was going nowhere. <laughs> and what happens, of course, Greenwood takes it over. And Greenwood is definitely, regardless of what they say in Grand Forks, it was the capital of the boundary country. And there is Greenwood in all its glory. That's a pan view. That's around the turn of the century or just slightly after. And when you walk down Copper Street in Greenwood, you saw a significant city. It was a bona fide city. It was incorporated. And there is Copper Street. And, uh, and of course, Copper There's an Street, election going on in this, oh, isn't there? Was, the Macintosh yeah. committee rooms. Yeah. Ron Smith, uh, Curtis, was yeah. running for something. Yeah. And look at the... I mean, yeah. it, was, it was bustling. Yeah, it was that's, bustling. That's close to the turn of the century again. And Copper Street was the main street because that was the main metal they were concerned with. Then yeah. there was Gold Street and Silver Street. And, of course, then you had the great, the mountain high camp. And this was a bona fide city. This was this was Phoenix. That's upper town alone. That's only part of the town, Mike. So the town is in the bottom half of this photo, That's right. and, and then you see the mills. Mills and, and the mines. And the, the mills mines and the mines. Them. And then there were pits up there. And the two great mines in Phoenix, of course, the two great mines for copper mines were the old Ironsides and the Knob Hill. And you can see them both in that photograph. And of course, then you can see Lower Town as well. But this was Lower Town with yeah. the Hotel Brooklyn. That's Lower and Town, the Hotel Brooklyn, and a lot of lot of buildings down there. Hundreds of buildings in Green uh, in Phoenix. It's all gone now, Mike. Nothing left. But this now, is what it looked like. This is a map of, of uh, this Phoenix is about 1911. Yeah. Now there, there we have the upper and lower town shown off again. Yeah. See, here's upper town. Yeah. And over here is lower town. Yeah. And just the sheer size of each one of those indicates to you just how big this community is. It was an important community. There's no doubt about there's it at all. Mines, it had a, a reputation that went right down into the states. Northern, Great Northern comes in at the bottom. Yeah. And I mean, a fascinating map. It shows two curling or two rinks, a curling rink and a and a and a hockey rink. Sure. It shows the post office. It shows everything. City Hall shows that, everything. That's a treasure. That oh, map. of course it is. Of course it is. But also shows something on the right hand side. Okay. Uh, which I think is very interesting. And this is what really this is the start of this story. And this is the gold belt. In in now the other part of the major mining was the copper belt. That's the old iron yeah, sides and the town Brooklyn was. and the Knob Hill and all the rest. But over on that side was the snowshoe Shoe. and the gold mm -hmm. drop and the rawhide. And these mines produced around 400,000 ounces of gold. 
400,000 yeah. ounces yeah. of gold. Yeah, that's about uh, 15 tons of gold. Now, when you put it in tons, that makes some impact, Mike. There's no doubt about it at all. And some of this was smelted in Grand Forks. Some of it was smelted in, in Greenwood. And they had three smelters in the Boundary Country. That's One, the big money. I mean, yeah. it cost big sure. money to put smelters in. Oh, sure in. it did. And that's, that's the Dominion Copper Company. That's the big smelter in Greenwood, right opposite. Remains of it are still there. The stack's still standing. And then down, down the creek, Boundary Creek, was the old Sunset Smelter. And that gives you an idea of what the rawhide and the gold drop and, and uh, the other mines, snowshoe were, the mines snowshoe yeah. and their gold mines in the area looked like. And they were just plowing right into the outer, the cap of rock that was there. Oh, sure. And they were, now you talk about problems with mines not going to depth. These, did they, because they got that much gold out of them? Well, they got a lot of gold out of them. And the, the, better, the better ore was at the surface. And as you got down, it decreased with depth. As, as is the old story of the Boundary Country, and generally in British Columbia, with some rare exceptions, right. Mike. And the rare exception had to be Rossland, which is just a little further, yeah. little further to the east. Yeah. Yeah. But the Golden City, they yeah. hauled gold out of there. Yeah, they did. Like they've never seen. That's very true. And we'll touch on that later. But, but essentially, this gives you an idea. Idea. So we did get gold out of the snowshoe and then the gold drop and the rawhide and you know 15 tons came out of there. But where did the gold come from? Well to, to assess that very very closely you have to look at the Placer Creeks. The Placer Creeks are the telltale sign. They're the clues you have to look at. And that's why Sam actually shifted eastward. Sam Bombini, Sam the guy Bombini. you alluded to in the first segment. That's right. And so there's, there's a big creek coming through Greenwood and that's Boundary Creek and it goes down and flows into the Kettle River on the U.S. side which is interesting. Now there's very little gold on Boundary Creek, except when you get down to Norwegian Creek. So you'll go past Lynn Creek and Twin Creeks and McCarran Creek and all Porter Nothing. Creek. They're all barren. They're virtually barren. But when you get to Norwegian Creek, the heavy gold starts. And I mean gold up to a quarter of a pound in the early days, quarter pound slugs. It was ounce a day diggings. So that gold came from that high reaches up in there. And remember it, it actually rises in the United States. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. And that's on the west side of Greenwood. Now you go onto the east side of Greenwood and you come down a creek that used to be called Fourth of July Creek. Now the upper part of Fourth of July has no gold. But as you get down to Scaff Creek, there's considerable chunky, rough, coarse edged gold on Scaff Creek. And then you go down just one further and that's onto May Creek. And there's coarse gold there. Now in Scaff Creek, old Cal Hopper did very well as a number of miners did. When you get onto May Creek, guys like Bob Campbell did very well. And then you go down into the States just on the U.S. side, and this big Goosemiss Creek and Little Goosemiss Creek, gold there as well. So that tells you that that gold was produced on those creeks by cutting through quartz veins somewhere above them, somewhere in the upper reaches of the creeks. Yep. So then you go, you have to go up, you have to go up Skeff Creek, you have to go up May Creek, and you have to go up Norwegian Creek, and it all centers not where the gold, not where the gold drop, and not where the not that, rawhide. Not that, that far north. No, not that far north. That was part of that vein. I think there's a major underlying vein because of the placer occurrences that is definitely cl close towards the U.S. side. Now, where were the pits that we talked about? Uh, oh, I don't know, uh, uh, quite Bombini's? a few years. Yeah. yeah I mean, well, were they, was that just a little bit further north? All through that country. All through that but country. But the pit that he found was in the area we're talking about. Okay. So this area is centered just beyond Skeff Creek, just beyond uh, May Creek, and just beyond Norwegian Creek. So much south of what people are generally looking for. That's where I think there may be a massive mine. Now it's covered by overburden a lot of this. The old timers were superb prospectors. There were still some good miners and prospectors in the area. But I think if I were to concentrate, if I were 20 years younger, that's where I would head, Mike. If you were 20 years younger. Yeah. But it seems to me that with all of these uh, evidences, yeah. Is it the overburden that denied them? Just the sheer, yeah. the, the fact that there's maybe a uh, hundred feet of glacial till over top of the hard rock and they just weren't going to do it? You can't see through 150 feet of gravel. It's very, very difficult to find your vein structure there. And you can't drill through it usually because it's too expensive. It's simply too expensive. Even was in the old days. So, so it if, may still be inaccessible. I think it may be. Unless you want to roll the dice. That's right. Take in a big open pit operation to get down there. Yeah, but that, that, you would never gamble like that. You would never gamble like that. It costs too much to set it up. So maybe the, some of the best treasures in British Columbia, gold sure. annals, will never be accessed it, because of the difficulty to get to it. It's quite possible. And I think that, I think that gold, gold streak... Gone and broken and my heart here, Bill. ...actually goes right into Danville, and we talked about the lost golden plate lights. That's only a couple of miles away. Only a couple of miles away, Mike. So I think the whole area really hasn't been prospected as thoroughly with the, with the devices we have now. All right, for heaven's sakes. We've got another couple of stories to tell you, and we'll do that right after this break. Don't go away.
Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barleen. We're talking about uh, maybe overlooked properties. I mean, the one we just yeah. talked about around Phoenix is one. And everybody, of course, knows about Rosslyn, the Golden sure. City, the Leroy, and all of that. But yeah. good to go back there again. Yeah, I think so. This uh, is Lower Street. This is early, early Rosslyn. That's Sourdough Avenue. That's, Sourdough that's the original. Avenue. That's the original avenue. That's taken about 1895, so about 100 years ago. It is really, it was quite a, it was a rollicking, rough, tough street, and the miners were just as tough as the town. Look at that kid is holding up auction house yeah. sale now going on. A little kid's got a Cars. job. Of course. That could have earns, been you, Bill. Earns a dime. A little bit later, well, that could have been later, you. a little later, yeah. And here you go. Is this Columbia? That's Columbia Avenue, and that's probably about 1896. This is after they make the major strikes on, on, on Red Mountain, on the Leroy, and the Center Star, and the War Eagle, and the, and the Nickel Plate, and the Josie, and all the rest of those mines. Absolutely spectacular. And here it shows some of the mines. Yeah, there and, they are, all right yeah, there. And, and there the, they are. And I used to wander through all of these when I was a kid, Mike. It was absolutely crazy. Drove your mother crazy. Yes, she didn't like it too much. And there's a close up of the center star. And look yeah. at the long. Uh, uh, shoots. What 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 came down there? Did the ore come down from uh, down that long chute there? No, actually, we what used to that? walk up that. That was where the miners used to walk up to the mine. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, I remember walking up that. It was still standing when I was a kid in the late 30s, so, early 40s. So there's Rossland in yeah. all its golden yeah. splendor. But but yeah, I love the. But and we part. we touched on this, just touched on it once in a program some I years can't ago. Can't even remember. And this was the uh, this was the OK Mountain region, and the OK Mountain region was about a mile away from Rossland, south and west of Rossland. As you go down Little Sheep Creek and down towards Northport, the old smelter. And That's the right. There's side. a highway that heads down sure, there now. Yeah? Sure. You can still go down there and see where the old railways used to come up. And there were railways coming up in the States and coming up and trailing all over the place. It was a beehive of activity. But down there in 1891, Mike, they found some ore that was so spectacular that it would drive, and it did drive some miners virtually crazy. They, actually, it was so rich that not even the Ministry of Mines could believe it. Right. Okay, you've got, and now, yeah. a Ministry of Mines journal yeah. is usually looked upon as being a conservative and pretty fair uh, representation. Very conservative indeed. And yeah. here's what they say in the 1920s in the Ministry of Mines reports, and I'll read it very briefly. We don't do it often, but it's worthwhile. One, one of these three properties on OK Mountain, there were three properties. The middle property was the IXL, and then on the flanks of the mountain was the OK, and on the other side was the Snowdrop, OK, or Snowdrip, and, and also the Midnight, OK? And it says about the IXL, this property situated within a short distance of Roston has been worked by leasers during the last five years. Wrong. Last 45 years. It is famous for the exceptionally high grade ore, gold ore it has produced. In fact, it has yielded some of the most spectacular specimens of gold quartz of any property in the province of British Columbia. And for the provincial mines guy to say the yeah. word spectacular in a write-up is... And here's something else, and he tries to play it down. Again, 1924. Shipments of rich ore were continued during the year from the IXL. Not many have been made, but some of the values have been exceptionally high. Some of the sorted ore ran as high or higher than 300 ounces to the ton in gold alone. Mike, 300 that ounces of gold to the ton. It's amazing. It's amazing. One of these mines was the OK, and the OK mine was one of the big three. And so this, this one here, I mean... Is that the mine right there? That's, That's the pretty mine rugged there. country. Yeah, it is pretty rugged. Okay, remember mountain. wandering down there and looking at this. They used to kick us out of there when we were nine or ten years old because the leases didn't want any kids hanging around. They were touching off charges of dynamite and they were drilling and they didn't want kids fooling around. And so probably they, they had the gold ore lying around everywhere. Well, actually, yeah, I mentioned it very briefly in one of their programs. They hit in there and there was the Osings and the Faces and the, and the Lins and a whole bunch of families who were leasers, good miners, good prospectors. But this was a fractured vein. The IXL vein, which went into both the, both the uh, OK and into the midnight, were fractured. So th they'd hit, as they said, 30 cent, 30 cent ore in some, some of the veins. I mean, useless, virtually uh, uh, yeah, barren ore. Country rock. And then million dollar ore in the, in the other veins. And probably the richest ton of gold ore ever to come out of Canada did not come out of Braylorn, which has the official record. It certainly came out of the IXL or the OK or the midnight. And because of the 1930s, more than 300 ounces. More than 300 ounces. They had an, an accepted 800 ounces to the ton, but that was only part of it. And I mentioned it many years ago. I said, look, it. They, they produced it in trail, and the trail smelter is there, and you can see the trail smelter, and here's the, here's the major smelter. This was where that, everybody sent their ore to get the... That's right, but behind that was a custom smelter, a little small custom smelter yeah. to run the gold. And, and behind that custom smelter was, was, a, was a walkway where all the workers came off shift. 
and they dumped a couple of tons of ore there from the O.K. Mountain region. And everybody who came by said, oh, well, they won't miss a chunk of that. And they put it in their lunch bucket. And they only got 800 ounces. It must have run at least 1,200 ounces. Some people say it ran 1,500 or 1,600 ounces to the ton. That's over 100 pounds to the ton in a little block or ore like this. You couldn't believe it. It would set a North American record. Nothing would touch it, Mike. Good and of course, heavens. and of course, you know, and I, I remember some of the some of the some of the miners used to go up to the Irvin Hotel, and the Irvin Hotel was owned by old Sam Irvin, and there it is. I used to walk up there. That's on Leroy, that's that's Leroy that's Avenue, and old Sam's in that photograph, mm -hmm. and they would go up there and talk about whether they were going to go back and mine this property or not. These are and, the guys that just come out of the thirty cent a ton stuff, of course, <laughs> and they go back to drown out their sorrows and stay at the Irvin Hotel, and that, and then somebody come up and say, hey, two weeks later. They hit a spectacular run of ore on the IXL. Back they'd go. Back they'd go. And it's still there. People are still poking away at it a hundred years later, more than a hundred years later, but it's a fractured system. It's sheared off. And if they don't know how to follow it. You look at the mind maps. They didn't know which way they were going. They were going by luck and miners' sense of a feel almost. Yeah. That's I mean, all. if we could now uh, looking at a surface map, you yeah. know, of, of you know, of, of a city map. Yeah. Uh, but but when you're doing gold, you have to tilt the world up, and uh, you enter on a here, yeah. and the seam would be here, and then suddenly oh, it would sure. reappear down here, sure. and then down here, and you'd have to yeah. Yeah. fiddle around to I'll find it. I'll tell you what you can do, Mike. You can take a look at the 1935 report of the Minister of Mines, and it'll tell you how tough that ground was to mine. But it is literally million dollar ore when they hit it. When they don't hit it, it's 30 cent ore. End of story. That is the OK Mountain yeah. area, just south and west of Rossland, down the road that heads down to uh, Northport, Northport sure. Washington. Yep. Excellent. Yeah. All right, for heaven's sakes. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it just again takes a few, and the old adage is to find gold, look where gold's already of been course, found. Of course, you stay in that area. Well, no. Stones throw from Red Mountain. OK, now j to wrap up, where do we go now? You've well, got a big theory about horsefly. Yeah, I have, and we did a story on horsefly some years ago. But, you know, horsefly is interesting, and I'll tell you why it's interesting. A Chinese prospecting party went into the, uh, followed down the horsefly river, panning as they went in the 1860s. Nobody's sure, quite sure because they kept it quiet. And they found a patch of placer ground there, which was absolutely spectacular. They took out around 100,000 ounces. Now, 100,000 ounces is about four tons, if I'm if I'm assessing that correctly. Four tons, and it was in cemented gravel. It was fairly deep, but it was only in a patch of ground about five acres. That's all. And they, when they came to the cemented gravel, they had a tough time pounding it down. They couldn't do it, so some other miners took over, like W.C. Ward. And W.C. Ward went in there in a huge operation, and there's the mill. And that was used to putting that, that cemented gravel. And when you get cemented gravel, Mike, quite often you get good gold in it. Now, that's strange, but it's true. It's not an infallible rule, but it's a good rule. So he put that ore through there, or the, the, the gravel through there that was cemented together, pounded it down, and then washed out the gold. And you can see how deep he went. There's a hydraulic elevator to pull, a, pull the, uh, the is... gravel up and put it through, and that picture's never been published before either. Look at that. That yeah. is all of uh, the workings, all of oh, the yeah. tailings, all of the uh, sure. unusable gravels that yeah. have been dumped on the side. Yeah. And uh, it, again, a big structure. Lots oh, of yeah. investment needed to put that together. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, we don't know how, how he did. He didn't republish the report, so I don't think he did too well. Okay. And here, here are some other ones down here as well. This, this shows the workings. Yeah, of the, that shows the workings. How deep they are. And they're using hydraulic down there. Hydraulic hasn't, doesn't have a lot of effect on cemented gravel, but some of the gravel above it and below it, it, it did. And it was a blue lead. When you What's find a, a blue, blue lead, lead, a blue lead is kind of a clay layer. And when you go down to the blue lead, usually the gravel above it is good, especially if it's oxidized. And that was the case. But once they got beyond it, Mike, once they got beyond this area, it ran right out. And that map, which was published, I think, in the 1920s, if I remember correctly, yeah. comes from the Minister of Mines reports again. That map tells you they drilled all over the place. They and put shafts down. That's what all of these uh, 21 foot to bedrock, 17.5 sure. to bedrock, 25 and a half to bedrock. And you always go to bedrock because your best values almost always are on bedrock or within 18 inches or two feet unless there's a, a false layer above, which yeah. is a false bedrock. But it wasn't there. So they got it in that five acres and then it disappeared. Now they found the, what they thought was the old channel, but there wasn't any gold in it. So here you had several tons of gold being run down from an original load somewhere close or fairly far away from horsefly. And it sits there, and it puts it down, 
several tons of it, and they can't find it anywhere else, Mike. Well, what is your suggestion, well, sir? I would, <laughs> I would suggest, and people have done this, of course, the good miners and the good prospectors have looked in the, in the hilly country close by to see if there's a high run that was running this gold down into, into horsefly, and uh, they can't find it. So this has been a puzzle in the caribou country for about uh, a century and a quarter. About a century and a So quarter. what you're saying is that you've got no particular better idea except no. that for anybody who's interested, if it can occur in one little five-acre chunk, yeah. you've got to know it's occurring at another little five-acre chunk somewhere in consolidated gravels in well, that area. Well, we have to look at the geological background of it. it. That gold traveled, and it traveled for some miles. And when it traveled, it always loses some gold, even if it comes in a rush, yeah. you know, in a freshet. It does lose the coarser gold. So some of it got down to the Horsefly River, but there is an old channel which led to that ground. Now, they went all around it, they said. Maybe they did and maybe they didn't, but they did get to deep ground and they didn't discover it in the deep ground either, Mike. All of this hidden channel stuff is very interesting yeah. because the bullion pit was an ancient, and it's right there. It's just to the but south. it's and high. It's, it's a high sure. old channel. Cedar Creek was high, but it was coarse gold. The bullion pit was fine gold. Cedar Creek was coarse gold. And... Uh, and that's the way it goes in, the, in those high channels. Usually the high channels tend to be a little coarser. They're tertiary channels. The theory is that the closer you are to the source, the sure. heavier the gold will sure. be. It'll fall out first. Yeah. You'll get your dust and yeah. uh, your, your powdery gold further away. Sure. All right. So there's the theories. Theory number one, Phoenix in the boundary country, yeah. that somewhere there to the south of Phoenix, on the southern slope sure. of those mountains, yeah. just before you get to the American border, yeah. is buried under some yeah. alluvial till, some uh, glacial till, yeah. gold. Somewhere around Mount Atwood, I think, or in the immediate area. And there's some good miners in the, in, in the Phoenix area, you know I, I mean? know. And there's some good, good promoters and some good mine owners, too. But Theory number two, uh, right uh, to the south and west in the O.K. Mountain yeah. area near Rossland. Yeah, fascinating area. Absolutely 1,200 ounces to the ton. Yeah, it's definitely. Not officially, officially 800. Unofficially, at least 1,200. And the third theory, at Horsefly, because they found the spectacular amount of gold yeah. in a little five-acre area of, un of consolidated right. cemented gravels, yeah. there's got to be another chunk somewhere. Sure, something leads to it. You exhaust me, Bill. I'm telling you, <laughs> one of these days, I just want you to take me to a creek with gold bumpling out of it, and we won't have to do this searching and theorizing. Yeah, well, the problem is, Mike, the old-timers didn't miss much. I guess so. Our story today from three locations in British Columbia, all of them a puzzle, but uh, if you're fascinated, wander on back there. I mean, horse flies up in that uh, Williams Lake country. You can get there easy and then start uh, salivating about the whole thing. Gold Trails and Ghost Times, we'll see you again next time.